Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Merry Christmas. This is going to be your first mailbag edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. So bear with me. Early signing period upon us begins Wednesday. If you're listening to this, this is posted on Tuesday. So Wednesday gets going with the early signing period. Things are looking good for the Mustangs on that front. The season just wrapped up on Saturday with uh, the Mustangs losing to BYU 24-23 in the New Mexico Bowl. And basketball gets back on the hardwood uh, with the Hawaiian Airlines Diamond Head Classic against Iona Thursday at 3 p.m. or, well, 2 p.m. Central Time on ESPNU. So if you're catching that one, uh, we'll jump back into basketball coverage really after uh, Christmas is kind of done and over with, but we'll have some thoughts uh, from that game on the site as well some, as a live thread. So check that out. But hope you guys all have a Merry Christmas, uh, New Year, all the things with the family. If you're traveling, travel safe. Um, I'm recording this and about to jump on a plane right afterwards. So look, we're going to divide this up. We're going to do another mailbag edition next week. Uh, when we're back, uh, we're going to touch on transfers. We're going to touch on recruiting, all of those things, because it's about to be kind of a busy finish on that front. I've got my phone here monitoring to see if anybody jumps on board while we are uh, recording this. But look, we've got a lot of podcast questions. Most of them going to be around conference realignment. So get your realignment hats on, get ready to rock. I'm going to dish on what I feel is happening right now with everything uh, going on now that UCLA is officially gone. We've got a ton of questions from our subscribers at ontheponyexpress.com. If you haven't jumped on board, get on the site, get yourself a free hat while they're still left. There's only a, few, a couple dozen left. So jump on board. Uh, it's also still $10 for a year. And if you're a current subscriber, and you refer someone, you get a free month uh, for doing that. So housekeeping out of the way, let's jump into the questions on Pac-12 realignment. We'll end with some uh, facility talk, and we will uh, also finish up with some NIL uh, talk as well um, for SMU, and then also finish with a, uh, a fun little question that one of our subscribers asked. So all of these are kind of all over the place, so um, I'm going to kind of hit on a bunch of topics with conference realignment and kind of go from there. So um, let's start with this. What are the odds that SMU will be playing football in the Pac-12 now that UCLA is gone? Are we still bullish on getting in if the Pac-12 decides to expand? Guestimate on Pac-12 timing on media and then expansion. So one of the things that I've always said, if you've stuck with us at OnThePonyExpress.com is this was going to be a long process. This was not going to be something that developed overnight. This wasn't going to be something just completely out of left field in terms of timing like these other expansion decisions have been. We've maintained that on the board. There are people saying September, people saying October. I've said as of late, you know, at least beyond the season and into uh, the early new year. That was kind of what I had heard. Um, I just knew it wasn't going to be as quick as, as some of the early guesstimates right after um, some of the other expansion and, and realignment that happened. So in terms of odds for SMU, I, I hate doing odds, right? Because they can change pretty quickly, of course, as we know. But I will say this. I, I liken SMU's odds to playing in the Pac-12 right now at a shade above 50%. And here's why. When you look at the discussion around Pac-12 realignment, they're getting, and, and Pac-12's media rights deals as well, they're having to get creative. And uh, the Sports Business Journal posted this, and they're very, very, very on top of these media rights negotiations that Amazon is actually prepared to um, take on the Pac-12 media rights deal. And that's the type of out-of-the-box thinking that I think the Pac-12 is trying to go with this time around. They know that they have completely butchered their brand to death. They lost, lost UCLA. They lost USC. Their only brand is Pac-12 after dark, quite frankly, and empty stadium pictures. So what do they need to do? They need to expand east. They need to get into a new time zone. And that's one thing that has been hammered home to me when talking with sources is that SMU feels like it's in the best position, barring a shocking poaching from another conference. But I really don't think there are any schools out there that are gung-ho about where the Pac-12 sits right now outside of group of five schools looking to move up. So SMU sits in the best position 
because they're in the central time zone. And not only that, they're in a top four, soon to be top three media market. They have a brand. They have history. Uh, they are on the up, um, believe it or not. Some people you know, freak out over games lost here and there. And, and certainly, look, SMU had a seven and six season at a time when they really needed um, another 10 win season, quite honestly. But they played a difficult schedule. They played it really well for the most part. Um, and again, they're driving interest in their program. Their attendance is on the rise uh, each of the last however many years, kind of outside of COVID. Um, but look, this is a program that is investing. They uh, have sent their last two head coaches to Power 5 programs. They have one of the hottest young, still young coaches in the industry, I would say, in, the, in terms of the group of five. Uh, in Rhett Lashley, he's not somebody that's been around like a Willie Fritz for a long time um, in, in that respect and has been at the helm of his program for a long time. So he's up and coming in that sense. And so, you know, you look at what SMU has to offer uh, the Pac-12 and it's pretty strong. You look at San Diego State, you look at UNLV, you look at some of those other schools that have been rumored here and there. They just don't bring anything new. UNLV would bring Vegas, but would they? I mean, it's just not a program that, uh, as of now, has gotten any sort of buzz outside of a new storyline, which had already been there in a way where you know the Pac-12 commissioner went to UNLV. UNLV. So I like SMU's odds a shade above 50% right now. That's just if they made a decision today and they went to add one or two, I think SMU would be in that spot um, right now based on what I've heard. So these things are... Just like, you know, you're waiting on a test result in school. They've put in the work. They continue to put in work, keep lines of communication open. Uh, but right now, it is a waiting game on these media rights deal uh, to get to get done. Um, you know, I think when you look at what SMU has done and asked, I was asked what Rick Hart and the administration has been doing to join a Power 5 conference um, and what they're doing, which also leads into SMU has consultants like Oliver Luck. And there are others that are silent partners with SMU going and vouching on SMU's behalf to have SMU join the Pac-12. And they list many of the reasons why I do uh, have SMU in the Pac-12 as well. So with having consultants, because you do need them to advocate on your behalf. I mean, let's be honest, SMU doesn't have a Tillman Fertitta that's going to go and blast it all over social media and 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 do that. And look, they haven't been able to claim a national championship like UCF, but uh, and then BYU is its own very unique brand, as everybody knows now on the podcast and has known for a while that finally took the jump. So, and that they're all, of course, headed to the Big 12, but this is a very natural progression for SMU's program. They've bettered their conference standing in each of their moves since uh, the, the Southwest Conference broke up. Uh, they have chipped away at their commitment to playing at the highest level. And look, I spoke with President RGL Turner after, after the groundbreaking of the end zone complex, which is one of the biggest um, you know feathers in the cap in terms of SMU's bid for realignment is that commitment that they're making in that end zone. And he basically said, you know, he wouldn't say it, but he said, we always want to compete at the highest levels. And this is us saying we're, we're here, we're here to be at the highest level. Um, we hope people take notice and we know people take notice when we do things like this. It's very strategic and, it, and it's not, you never want to blast the conference that you're in, in a way. And look, we can have the debate of if SMU should be more aggressive publicly in this respect but at the same time i mean rhett lashley just talked about it earlier this year um in terms of showcasing for the for the power five like their football program doesn't look at games by games and say oh yeah we got to win this one for pac-12 realignment that's not the type of program you want to operate under um but i think they know that you know that type of move and that type of um you know addition to what SMU has would be massive. And um, so he didn't back down necessarily from, from, you know, saying that you want to compete at the highest level. And I think that's kind of the innuendo of it all uh, behind the scenes, you know, R. Gerald Turner, this has been a big charge from David Miller, a big charge from, you know, Bill Armstrong, a lot of the, uh, you know, 
heavy hitters at SMU is let's go. Let's what are we doing? Uh, keep it, keep it going, keep the momentum. That's why SMU is invested in these consultants. That's why SMU is taking meetings. They've been taking meeting for, meetings for years. And the program, quite honestly, with Chad Morris wasn't in position for it. With Sonny Dykes, it was getting there. And now with Rhett Lashley, they, you know, had kind of a, they had a decent year, uh, but it was a program in transition at this time too. So they've been showing that commitment level, investing in the staff, investing in facilities and you know smu has its issues at times and i think we all know that we saw what happened with the tcu game this year in terms of the you know ford stadium not being stocked we saw what happened um you know with the public uh you know breakup last year with sunny dykes and and how that all went and sometimes how it was handled quite quite frankly but they have continuously gotten better in their commitment to the program and commitment to putting SMU athletics at the, at the top. Um, and I think you're seeing president Turner in particular, take more leadership positions. He's on the college football playoff committee. He was key in expansion, which not only helps SMU, let's look at it like this. Obviously there's a big win for SMU in the right now that the AAC now has a path to play for a college football playoff play in the college football playoff. That is a win for SMU in the right now, that is undeniable and a good thing. You can be happy about that. You can also make the point that if SMU does win big and does go to the college football playoff and gets that opportunity to make a statement, that's good for their realignment chances. Because look, we don't necessarily know that expansion is going to happen with the Pac-12 based on how their media rights discussions go. They could sit pat. They probably won't, but it could drag out. It could be something that they that they end up saying, you know what, let's let's keep monitoring it. Let's keep building our brand. Let's work on this TV rights deal and see what happens with that before we make a rash decision and try to add someone. Now, they've been working behind the scenes on it for a very long time, so I expect them to do that. But if SMU has the ability to make a run and make a college football playoff appearance, that's huge. If they did that next year and there hadn't been a decision on realignment, now all of a sudden SMU is the hottest name in college football in terms of the G5 program. So... They've got things to do um, still. They, they have to continue to make those phone calls, continue to network. Uh, it's a big part of that. Um, I know there's a lot of people in the SMU administration as well as the uh, Board of Trustees that are hard at work on it. I mean, that's the only thing you can kind of say because this program, and this kind of moves into um, the state of the program, is on the up. They didn't start out the season the way they wanted to, but they finished very well, had a tough loss in the bowl game, certainly. Uh, to BYU, but they didn't not show up. They didn't not fight. Next year, the expectations, 10 wins. 10 wins and probably playing for a conference championship. That is the expectation. And it, quite frankly, probably has to be met. You're going to have a first-year true starter in Preston Stone or Kevin Henry Jennings, but they've both been around now a minute, both gotten playing in time. You are reloading in the transfer portal. We've seen that at a very high rate. Uh, with SMU this cycle, and they push their chips in. So the trajectory of the program is very, very impressive right now, in my opinion. They still have to show more on the field in terms of wins. That's the name of the game. Rhett Lashley knows that. The staff knows that. That's why they've gone so hard on um, working through the roster and transfers and all of those things, um, you know, this offseason already. So, um Odds are sitting a shade above 50% to kind of shut that part of uh, the discussion down. Now, we get into hypothetically, if SMU gets into the pack or, you know, received an invite in January, would SMU ditch the 2023 AAC schedule or would it take a year for SMU to play a pack schedule? My opinion, it would take a year at least. Um, I would expect it to be a year. Uh, an early exit fee, you would see SMU stroke that check so quickly, uh, it'd make your head spin. Uh, and they'll raise the money later um, because it is uh, certainly a an opportunity to bring in much more uh, revenue, uh, bring in better um, programs into Ford Stadium. But I don't think they'd be able to get out of the AAC before 2023. So um, that gives everybody kind of time. If they got it in January, I mean, there'd be a slight chance, but I just don't see it um, with with what they you know, have on the table right now. The bright side is 
They have Oklahoma. They have TCU. They have North Texas on there um, for the 2023 schedule. They're looking for one more. I know that was a question asked. I'm going to try to dig around on that after Christmas and into the New Year's. See where SMU's at um, with that um, last spot for an out-of-conference game. Um, but I would expect them to be playing in the Pac-12 in 2024 rather than 2023 at this point. Um, kind of building off that, we kind of go into – um, with media rights deals and kind of the direction of NIL, the the phrase players deserve a piece of the pie was and is used when it comes to money in college and NIL. However, the way I see it is the, the play, players still aren't seeing money from TV. How do you see this situation evolving regarding players getting the money from the TV contracts? Here's the thing. There are very few brand name players in college football that move the needle in such a way that they deserve a massive amount of compensation. Because if there's one thing we know, these schools stay and these players come and go. So if you have a Heisman Trophy winner, he might move the needle. If you have um, a dynamic running back or a Tyron Matthew type defender, um, those are the type of players that move the needle. And even then, I don't know how much that moves the needle in terms of actual compensation. There are, I'm sure, marketing agencies that have that type of data in terms of why and how and uh, player likability and things like that in marketing that uh, could determine that. But I don't know if it would be usable in terms of TV rights deals and how these players are compensated. And we kind of saw that with NCAA when they went through um, the EA Sports, you know, lawsuit kind of about player uh, earn, players earning money off of their names and image and likeness and all that, which is really what started all of this. So um, I, I haven't heard too much about the piece of the pie. I would love to see the players just get a little. I mean, but again, how does it how is it determined? Do you have to hire an arbitrator to determine that? Um does the 84th and 85th scholarship player get any of it? You know, does somebody who red shirt uh, one year, do they get any of it? Cause they didn't participate. Um, so that's something that they would have to obviously work through. I'm all for the players getting as much as they can. I don't like the fact that it's become pay for play. Let's be real. Um, but I do love the fact that players can capitalize on their brands, capitalize on legitimate business deals with, um, uh, clothing brands with uh, whatever um, that they want to, um, you know, while they're in college. I think, you know, it's very natural. If you're an influencer in the real world and you're just a regular college student, you can capitalize it on, capitalize on it all you want. So, um, yeah, I think the TV rights deals will be difficult to kind of manage in terms of players getting a piece of the pie. Moving on to uh, facilities, any new info on the new operations and stadium renovation uh, for the football ops building? Any updated renderings I could show? I don't have them with me on the pod, um, and I haven't seen too many differences. But uh, in terms of timelines and rumblings around the stadium renovation, uh, th look, this is this is something that is um, almost ready to break ground. I believe they're going to start shortly after the new year. They finished up the paperwork right around now, um, if it's not done already. So construction is ready to start. Um, talk to the few people involved with that on the actual construction company side of things. Um, and again, it's look, it's shovel ready. So um, they just needed all those final uh, paperworks and things like that handled and done. Um, in terms of some updated thoughts on it, I think it's going to be pretty cool to have the team run out of that tunnel um, more of a showcase, I think, for them rather than the corner. And then also, um, they are going to leave a little area uh, called the berm, and it's going to be just to the right. If you're looking at the band in the student section, it's going to be a, a grassy area. So there's still going to be a spot for students to sit. It's not going to be a massive, you know, what would I would call about three or four sections worth of seating, but that grassy area is still going to be there. So that'll be packed. That'll be fun for students. They'll sit in the stands. They'll be fine. Just like in September, it's going to be determined about, you know, who they're playing. If they're playing Lamar, it's going to be relatively quiet, I think. If they're playing TCU, um, if they're playing OU, whatever, the thing's going to be packed. Um, still hot, but they're going to find a way. So 
that was a big development that, um, you know, the, the school shared is that, that that part of the berm is still going to be there. So that'll be exciting for the kids to uh, still have. And um, but yeah, I think this thing's pretty much shovel ready. It'll get going shortly here after Christmas. Um, and it just uh, it's going to be a first class facility. I'm really excited to see how it comes out. Um, and then uh, insight into the state of our NIL fund. Um, I would say, and and if you don't follow Pony Law Express on the on the Pony Express message board, definitely check him out. I've got a couple of your questions, PLE, uh, that we're going to get to after the Christmas uh, break when we go through kind of the season and look at the transfer portal and and look ahead to 2024 and things like that. But um, he's done a great job with uh, the the uh, Pony Sports DTX, and if you see all those transfers jumping in, you can thank him for organizing it. The coaching staff did a great job uh, of recruiting. They've done, um, you know, a really good job of building off their relationships. Uh, the NIL fund is, is good. And it's, um, I believe just right around where it was last year, they're a little bit short. Um, but again, this was, that was something built over the last, however many months, you know, to fight back against Sunny Dykes. It was kind of, in my opinion, flying by the seat of its pants last year. Now, we're seeing a much more calculated approach. We're seeing a much more deliberate approach with uh, getting uh, current players back and um, renewing deals and how the new deals look. Um, so they're they're doing, I think, they have much more information than they had, had a year ago. You know, to retain some of the players SMU did last year, that fund just went and got it done. And in reality, you know, there were some that didn't necessarily return on investment in that sense. So... I think you you look at the job they're doing and it's terrific. Um, they they have just completely changed the game for SMU. I have other college coaches at the Power Five level texting me saying, "What is going on over there?" Uh, the Pony Express is back. It is very much back, uh, and it's an exciting time. So if you're on the site, if you're a hardcore recruiting guy, um, first of all, appreciate you being on the site. But also, I would bet you Pony Law Express would love uh, for you guys to jump on board with Pony Sports DTX. So. That is going really well. Um, and kind of back to realignment, if SMU were to land in a P5 conference and given SMU's existing NIL and future NIL potential, what's the ceiling in term of, terms of roster construction? I think you would look for SMU to be landing a few four stars out of high school a year. I would probably venture to say you would want about half your high school recruiting class uh, being four stars. Other would be three, occasional five star here or there. Um, but you're still an up and coming program. You're kind of, you're, you're kind of Vanderbilt in this sense. You would be an up and coming program. Vanderbilt's on the rise right now, by the way. So time's up. Well, I say that, uh, you'd get the, you know, few four stars. You don't have the sec like Vandy does, but you have a better chance at winning in the PAC 12 than Vandy seems to have in the sec. And you try to hone in on playing bigger opponents um, playing on a national stage um, and playing in Dallas, a huge city. So I think the roster construction from the high school level goes up. I think to an extent it improves from the transfer level front, but we've also seen SMU go absolutely nuts when it comes to the transfer portal and picking up players that give it, honestly, one of the best portal classes in the entire country, um, regardless of level. So I think this is a this is a program that would benefit – uh, from a Pac-12 move in a big way on the high school recruiting front, that is usually, and this is a cop-out, but that is usually what loses SMU recruiting battles, quite honestly. When they lose a player that they've kind of been rolling on, it's usually because of the conference. Um, or the player blows up and gets a big, big offer and that you know SMU would lose them anyway. But very, very consistently, it's probably the the, the Power 5 battle that they face. You couple that with improved recognition nationally around the NIL program and more money flowing into the program. This is going to be something that if it happens, look out, SMU is going to only get better in terms of its roster without a doubt. Um, in terms of the recruiting pitch to transfer guys, uh, you know, is it will SMU be in a new conference in a year or two? Uh, can they go to the next level and play in the NFL? Um, why would all the players? want to come to SMU when you're just, you know, being able to be the king of the midgets. 
And look, there's some credence to that. You know, I think now with the college football playoff expansion being there, I do think you can pitch to build something special, win a conference championship and go to the college football playoff and really show who you are on a national level. I think that is there. And now um, it can happen. It's a reality. And then, you know, you look at Rhett Lashley, and I think this is a huge difference from him and Sonny Dykes, and this isn't a shot at Sonny Dykes or anything like that, so don't take it that way. But from the get-go, the pitch was to Rasheed Rice. The pitch was to Jalen Thomas. Um, the pitch was to some of these different players, come back, we're going to get you to the NFL, and we're going to boost your draft stock. Go look at what he did for Rasheed Rice. Go look at what they did for Jalen Thomas. He ended up playing all five positions. His draft stock is marketably better, um, and certainly Rasheed Rice is. And they showcase receivers like, I mean, honestly, as as well as anyone in the country. You know, there's Ohio State, LSU. They need to, you know, LSU needs to get back to it. They had a kind of a down year for receivers. Alabama, they had a down year for receivers. Um, I mean, look around. There's not many programs right now that are really, really doing it at an elite, elite clip. And SMU has sent their top one or two receivers to the league each of the last however many years. Um, so it's it's a program now that is certainly built on playmakers making plays. SMU's had multiple DBs play in the league. They've had a good run of players playing in the league. And you look at the recent run of receivers and you look at the Kylan Granson and even Ryan Becker and um, I'm, I'm forgetting one right now. Uh, Grant Calcaterra, um, Xavier Jones had a cup of coffee in the league uh, and has been around a minute, you know, got hurt. They played for Rhett Lashley. And so I think that's not lost on a lot of these guys. You look at the Miami players that are coming to SMU. I think they recognize it. I think the the push to be developed for the league is as big as any re- recruiting pitch that they have. Come to SMU, you make it to the league, help us win a championship, uh, and now have a chance to play for a college football playoff. So I know it's one of those things where it all sounds nice and it has to come together. And there are some recruits and there's some transfers that listen and say, you know what, you're right. And there's some recruits and transfers that say, yeah, I'm just going to go try to do it at the power five level. Seems easier or, or seems, you know, like I can, I can do that there and, and play, you know, at a bigger school. Um, and I can't fault them for that. It happens. Um, but I just think the brand under Rhett Lashley and, and people don't really realize Rhett Lashley was a very, very good recruiter as a coordinator and an assistant. Um, and he's shown that on his staff, I think too. Um, they've done a really good job. You look at the high school recruiting class, um, as I'm recording this Tuesday, I mean, they haven't lost. I don't think they have a decommitment in the class. Um, off the top of my head, I could be completely wrong on that, but, um, you know, this is a, this is a program. The only decommitment they had was, um, oh gosh, the, uh, hold on. I'm looking it up right now. Uh, he ended up going to SFA to be a, be a thrower. Um, oh wow. This class has been going a while. So the, the decommitments, Richter Connolly. Um, this is actually, wow, these are five of them. This is how long this go was. Uh, Cordell Russell decommitted way, way back um, when Sonny Dykes left. Uh, Bryson Washington, um, who is a Franklin athlete. He's a Baylor commit. Um, he, he had committed to SMU, and then um, I believe he, he flipped pretty much right after that. He'd just gotten the SMU offer, or the Baylor offer. Yeah, he, it's pretty close. Um, he was committed a whole eight days. Um, and then, uh, big Mike Naredo Stoker, kind of same thing with TCU committed for a cup of coffee, um, was with SMU early and then, uh, ends up decommitting. Um, so he's going to sign with TCU or has signed by the time you're listening to this. And then Wesley Watson was actually, um, cut. He was kind of a gray shirt that SMU moved on from. So look, there, there are always kind of exceptions and Obviously, this recruiting cycle has been a long one considering it spanned two staffs. But um, Rhett Lashley is very much a recruiter. And Rob Likens is very much a recruiter. And he's done a great job keeping Jamari and Carroll. You look at Calvin Thibodeau, same thing. Craig Nivers' guys signed with SMU despite him leaving. Um, and, and I you know, don't think that's a um, you know, shot against Niver, But you know, Rhett Lashley and his staff have built this up to where, you know, they get it from a recruiting perspective that coaches leave and it happens and these guys have all stuck it out. So I just think this program has a chance to really be at a high level. 
um, with their recruiting, both in the transfer and the high school front, and especially if they get into the Pac-12. So finally, going to end on this. And again, we have a lot more questions, but um, been going on a while now. Um, what is my best slash favorite article that you can discuss that you ever wrote, even just rough notes, but were unable to post it due to not happening? And why is it Lincoln Riley signing to be head coach of SMU? So I actually, and this is more of a pre-write thing. So any of my LSU fans uh, that are on, uh, you know, follow me on the podcast, listen to this, don't take this for anything more than this. But I actually had a Lincoln Riley to LSU pre pre-write um, from when he was at Oklahoma. And uh, obviously it ended up being Brian Kelly, but um, had good information that he was going to interview and do that after Bedlam. But instead USC got him. I remember getting flamed on uh, Oklahoma fans on Twitter um, after he said after Bedlam he was staying at, or, or he was not going to take the LSU job and then the next day took the USC job. So um, I was right. He was looking to leave. But anyway, I would say for SMU, I would say, I mean, I would say Chad Morris to Baylor is one. Um, he was really gunning for that one. Um I would say I would say Chad Morris to Baylor, and then because of that, we had Lincoln Riley to SMU uh, teed up in the wings, waiting on that one. Um, and that was a wild time. That was back when we did the like I think we did the subscription only podcasts. Um, would love to get back to subscription only podcasts on some degree too. So um, hopefully YouTube can kind of do some like subscription angle to this, kind of like a Twitter. Um, what is it? A, a super follow where you pay like ten bucks to follow your favorite. Um, like reporter and they dish out info behind that or whatever. Um, but I would say Lincoln Riley to SMU um, is probably one. I don't really think I have too many that are in the hopper from um, our move to on three. Um, you know, we had a Sonny Dykes extension one here or there um, during that time, but that was before. Um, let me see. I, I think that's kind of it. Um, I don't really think there are any others that really stand out. I mean, a recruiting one was Savion Bird. That was probably ready to go for a long, long time. Um, but yeah, I would say Lincoln Riley to SMU was certainly the biggest one, uh, that never saw the light of day. So, um, but yeah, fun question. Good one to end on. Hope you guys have a Merry Christmas. Again, we'll try to get you guys a podcast uh, to kind of recap signing day. It might be a short one um, Thursday morning uh, to kind of recap that, but no promises. It's uh, by that point uh, going to be down in Florida with some family. So anyway, wrapping up this mailbag edition of the podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Get on the site. Lots of transfer news coming. A lot of on three RPM picks in. We've got more to come. So jump on the site. $10 for a year please hit that subscribe button to our YouTube channel. It helps me out in a big, big way. If you know an SMU fan, um, share our YouTube channel and ask them to subscribe as well. So um, there's just a button. Uh, there's a link right down here that says subscribe. You can click it in one click and be subscribed. So hope you guys have a Merry Christmas. Have a great rest of the week. Signing day on Wednesday. Get on on theponyexpress.com. We'll have full coverage of that. Hope you guys have a good one and we will talk um, next time. Have a good week, everyone. Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year.